Hello students and welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Dr. Vageshwari, teaching at Faculty of Law, University of Delhi. Today, we will discuss the module, Rape, the Worst Crime Against Womanhood. This module is a part of the paper, Women and the Law, for the discipline, Women's Studies. The objectives of this module are firstly to understand what constitutes rape, to generate awareness regarding the relevant legal provisions against this crime, to remove negative attitudes and perceptions associated with rape survivors and to sensitize people to help survivors receive justice under our criminal justice system. First of all, let us try and understand what is the term rape. The term rape, it can be traced to the Latin term rapier, which translates as to snatch or to grab a woman forcefully. The offense of rape in its simplest term is the ravishment of a woman without her consent, by force, fear or fraud. The genesis of the term rape can be traced to the Latin term rapier that translates as to snatch or to grab and rape is the worst crime against womanhood. It is the most morally and physically reprehensible crime in a society as it is an assault on the body, mind and privacy of the victim. While a murderer destroys the physical frame of the victim, a rapist degrades and defiles the soul of a helpless female. Rape was recognized as a crime under Section 375 of the Indian Penal Code in the year 1860. It was amended in the year 1983 and further amended in the year 2013. Now, rape is a gender specific crime. What do we mean by this? It means that rape can be committed only by a man and that too against a woman. For violations of men by other men or men by women, the term that is used is sexual assault. Now, there is a neutral law to deal with cases of sexual assault and that law is Protection of Children Against Sexual Offences Act. In India, this is the law which deals with sexual assault of minors and this is gender neutral, meaning that both boys as well as girls can be victims of sexual assault and the crime can be committed by men as well as women. But for adults, we have retained the gender-specific crime of rape as in our country, equality of the sexes is a distant dream and making it gender-neutral would pave the way for further exploitation of women. The rape laws that we have in existence today were not developed in a day. It has been a long process. There have been certain landmark judgments that have led to massive changes in the existing rape laws in India. There was Mathura case, which led to amendments in the criminal law in the year 1983. Thereafter, we got the Nirbhaya judgment, which led to amendments in the year 2013. Besides these, Significant guidelines were also laid down by the courts in the landmark judgment of uh, Gurmeet Singh versus State of Punjab in which the Supreme Court stressed on the significance of sensitization of judges while dealing with rape cases.
Thereafter, we had a landmark judgment in the case of Sakshi versus Union of India. In Sakshi versus Union of India, the main issues that were raised were the petitioners requested the court that the definition of sexual intercourse as defined under Section 375 should be broadened so as to include within its ambit all forms of penetrative violations of the female anatomy and they also challenged the concept of implied irrevocable matrimonial consent. The Supreme Court declined to expand the existing definition of rape on the ground that legislation was the duty of the legislature and judges in the garb of interpretation could not legislate and expansion of an existing definition which was established by the legislature would amount to the same and this would lead to allegations of judiciary trying to interfere in the legislative ambit but the significant point about this judgment was that certain directions were issued. The court instructed that all inquiry and trials in rape cases should be held in camera. They also said that victims should be screened and all the vulnerable witnesses such as child witnesses, they should all be screened from the offender or the accused person. The court also said that cross-examination of victims of sexual assault should be conducted in a sensitized manner and victims of child abuse or rape while giving testimony in courts should be allowed sufficient breaks as and when required. In December 2012, the entire nation was outraged by the brutal gang rape of a 23-year-old young paramedic who was stripped, raped and thrown out of a moving bus on a cold winter night. The Braveheart fought back her assailants which earned her the title of Nirbhaya. The girl eventually succumbed to her injuries but this led to constitution of Verma committee and this eventually led to the criminal law ordinance act which was promulgated by the president in February 2013 and finally the passing of criminal laws amendment act in the year 2013. All the accused were arrested and booked. In March 2013 Ram Singh one of the accused persons was found dead in prison in August 2013, another one of the accused, a minor, allegedly the most brutal of all, was given three-year sentence in a reformatory. The other four accused, convicted under sections 302, 120B, 365, 366, 376-2G and 377, were finally awarded death penalty. Now, let us try and understand what amounts to rape. The term rape, as amended in the year 2013, has been defined under Section 375 of the Indian Penal Code. Now, following the 2013 amendments, rape is no longer restricted to penile vaginal penetration. Any of the acts if committed without the consent or against the will of the woman would amount to rape. So here on the screen you can see the acts which have been narrated and all these acts they include all sorts of penetrative violations of the female anatomy. So what Sakshi had demanded was finally delivered after this Criminal Laws Amendment Act of the year 2013. Rape is a question of law. What this implies is that the physical act of establishing sexual relations with a woman by itself does not establish the crime of rape. What needs to be proven is that in addition to sexual intimacy, what happened that was that the act which was committed against a woman should be done against her will. That is, despite a stiff resistance from her. Secondly, without her consent. Thirdly, 
with her consent when her consent has been obtained by putting her or any other person in whom she is interested in fear of death or of hurt fourthly with her consent when the man knows that he is not her husband and that her consent is given because she believes that he is another man to whom she is or believes herself to be lawfully married fifthly with her consent when at the time of giving such consent by reason of unsoundness of mind or intoxication or the administration by him personally or through another of any stupefying or unwholesome substance she is unable to understand the nature and consequences of that to which she gives consent sixthly with or without her consent when she is under 18 years of age seventhly when she is unable to constitute when she is unable to communicate consent now let us understand what constitutes consent the indian penal code does not define the term consent in very clear terms section 90 of the ipc just mentions what cannot be regarded as consent section 90 of the ipc provides that consent is presumed to be given only when it is not given under fear of injury or misconception of fact thus a person is presumed to have consented only when the consent was given freely voluntarily and without the influence of any fear force or fraud operating on the mind of the victim to constitute consent under section 375 there must be an intelligent and mature understanding of the nature and consequences of sexual act if a girl meekly passively submits or she does not resist the advances of the accused because of fear it cannot be presumed to be consent for the purposes of section 375 as you can see on the screens no means no no in itself is a complete statement which does not require any further clarification section 114a of the indian evidence act lays down that in rape trials there is a presumption as to absence of consent on behalf of the woman and the onus is on defense to prove otherwise thus if the female says that she did not consent to the act of sexual intercourse her statement will be presumed to be correct and it will be taken as conclusive evidence the burden would lie on the accused to rebut the same and prove that the intercourse was done with the consent of the woman the proviso to section 146 of the indian evidence act provides that in prosecutions for rape or for attempt to commit rape where the question of consent is an issue the court shall not permit anyone to adduce evidence or to put questions in the cross examination of the victim pertaining to the general immoral character or previous sexual experience of the victim with any person for proving the consent or quality of consent thus evidence of character or previous sexual experience is irrelevant in prosecutions for rape even in cases where there is some material to show that the victim was habituated to sexual intercourse no inference of the victim being a woman of easy virtues or a woman of loose moral character can be drawn even of woman who was previously habituated to sexual intercourse has a right to protect her dignity and cannot be subjected to rape only for the, on the ground that she was previously habituated to such activities merely because a woman is of easy virtue her evidence cannot be discarded on that ground alone rather it is to be cautiously appreciated even if the victim of rape was previously accustomed to sexual intercourse it cannot be the determinative question on the contrary the question still remains as to whether the accused committed rape on the victim on the occasion complained of 
even if the victim had lost her virginity earlier, it can certainly not give a license to any person to rape her. Whether the victim is of promiscuous character is totally an irrelevant issue altogether in a case of rape. Even a woman of easy virtue has a right to refuse to submit herself to sexual intercourse to anyone and everyone because she is not a vulnerable object or prey for being sexually assaulted by anyone and everyone. Now, there is an important question which is raised many times, which is whether having sex with a woman on false promise of marriage it amounts to rape. Now this deals with issues wherein the woman consents because she believes that the man whom she is consenting to has promised her marriage and the man intends to honor the promise that he has made to the woman. In the case of Pradeep Kumar Verma versus State of Bihar which is a 2007 judgment the Supreme Court ruled that consensual sex shall not amount to rape. The court observed that there is a clear distinction between rape and consensual sex and the court must very carefully examine whether the accused had actually wanted to marry the victim or had malified motives and had made a false marriage only to satisfy his lust as the latter would fall within the ambit of cheating or deception. There is a distinction between mere breach of promise and not fulfilling a false promise. So here, the determining factor would be what was the intention of the boy. At the time when he made the promise, did he intend to marry the woman? If the answer is yes, then that would not amount to making of a false promise. But if the boy had promised marriage just to induce the woman to say yes and he had no intentions whatsoever of keeping his promise in the future, then in such cases it would amount to making of a false promise and getting the consent of the woman on the basis of such false pro promise which would amount to the crime of rape. So here what is important to be seen is what was the intent of the boy. If he wanted to keep his promise but he could not honor his promise in future because of some change in the circumstances then that doesn't mean that he had committed rape initially. Because see when two consenting adults they enter into a relationship there is love between them. So if we have to see whether the promise was made by the boy only to satisfy his lust, then that is something which amounts to rape, not otherwise. Now coming to the issue of rape and live-in relationships. Nowadays, we have seen so many cases coming before the courts in which when a long-term relationship goes sour, then the woman says that she had been raped. In January 2008, the Supreme Court of India validated long-term live-in relationships as marriages. The Supreme Court opined that a man and a woman living together without marriage cannot be construed as an offence. When two people want to live together, what is the offence? Does it amount to an offence? A special three-judge bench consisting of the then Chief Justice of India, Justice K.G. Balakrishnan and Justices Deepak Verma and Justice B.S. Chauhan observed. The Supreme Court said that there was no law prohibiting live-in relationships or premarital sex. Living together is a right to live, said the Supreme Court, apparently referring to Article 21 of the Constitution of India, which guarantees right to life and personal liberty as a fundamental right. The Supreme Court made this observation while reserving its judgment on a special leave petition which was filed by a noted South Indian actress Kushbu seeking to quash 
22 criminal cases filed against her after she allegedly endorsed premarital sex in interviews to various magazines in the year 2005. Live-in relationships are a reality of contemporary society. So instead of trying to brush the issues arising out of live-in relationships under the carpet, it is pertinent that we address the same. And as far as keeping the live-in relationships outside the purview of Section 376 of the IPC is concerned, the same would amount to giving the live-in relationships the status of matrimony, something which the legislature has chosen not to. Thus, live-in relationships, they cannot be kept out of the purview of rape. Consent, it cannot be implied in live-in relationships. Consent is implied in matrimonial relationships, as is clear in, under our laws, and marital rape is not punishable. But such kind of a consent is not to be presumed in case of live-in relationships. In case of live-in relationships, when two consenting adults enter into a consensual relationship, what is required is active consent that should be given by both the partners and the consent of the woman would have to be sought every time the man seeks to establish intimacy with her. The defense of consent is available only in marital relationships, not in live-in relationships. Section 376 of the Indian Penal Code provides punishments for rape. It reads, whoever except in the cases provided for in subsection 2, commits rape, shall be punished with rigorous imprisonment of either description for a term, which shall not be less than 7 years, but which may extend to imprisonment for life, and shall also be liable to fine. 376 Clause 2 reads, Whoever, being a police officer, commits rape, within the limits of the police station to which such police officer is appointed or in the premises of any station house or on a woman in such police officer's custody or in the custody of a police officer subordinate to such police officer or being a public servant commits rape on a woman in such public servant's custody or in the custody of a public servant subordinate to such public servant or being a member of the armed forces deployed in an area by the central or a state government commits rape in such area or being on the management or on the staff of a jail, remand home or any other place of custody established by or under any law for the time being in force or of a women's or children's institution commits rape on any inmate of such jail, remand home, place or institution or being on the management or on the staff of a hospital commits rape on a woman in that hospital or being a relative, guardian or teacher of or a person in a position of trust or authority towards the woman commits rape on such woman or commits rape during communal or sectarian violence or commits rape on a woman knowing her to be pregnant or commits rape on a woman incapable of giving consent or being in a position of control or dominance over a woman commits rape on such woman or commits rape on a woman suffering from mental or physical disability or while committing rape causes grievous bodily harm or maims or disfigures or endangers the life of a woman or commits rape repeatedly on the same woman, shall be punished with rigorous imprisonment for a term which shall not be less than 10 years, but which may extend to imprisonment for life, which shall mean imprisonment for the remainder of that person's natural life and shall also be liable to fine. In addition to the above discussed legislative provisions, there are certain other progressive provisions also related to the crime of rape, like Section 228A of the Indian Penal Code imposes a bar on the disclosure of identity of rape victims. 
Section 357A and B of the Criminal Procedure Code make provision for compensation to the victim or her dependents. Now, this compensation is in addition to any fine that may have been imposed on the accused. Section 357 B and C of the Criminal Procedure Code provide for first aid or medical treatment to be provided immediately and free of cost to the rape victim. Section 357C of the CRPC is mandatory in character and there is a punishment prescribed up to one year for non-compliance with this provision. The punishment is prescribed under Section 166B of the Indian Penal Code. Then Section 114A provides a presumption as to absence of consent in certain prosecutions for rape. Then recording of FIR has been made mandatory in cases of rape and delay in lodging of an FIR is not acceptable in rape cases. This has been laid down under Section 166A of the Indian Penal Code which prescribes punishment for a public servant who unnecessarily causes a delay in registration of FIR. Then, Section 327 of the Criminal Procedure Code provides for in-camera proceedings in rape trials and that too, as far as possible, by a woman judge or magistrate. There is also a provision for fast track of rape trials. The law says that the trials are to be conducted on a day-to-day -day basis. Unnecessary adjournments are not to be permitted and trials are to be conducted within a period of two months from the date of filing of the charge sheet. Now, as you can see on the screens, it is a dress, not a yes. What this implies is that rape has got nothing to do with what a woman is wearing or the way she is conducting herself. Rape has got only and only to do with the mentality of the accused person. In the case of State of Punjab versus Ramdev Singh, the Supreme Court observed that sexual violence apart from being a due humanizing act, is an unlawful intrusion on the right of privacy and sanctity of a woman. It is a serious blow to her supreme honor and offends her self-esteem and dignity as well. It degrades and humiliates the victim and where the victim is a helpless innocent child or a minor, it leaves behind a traumatic experience. A rapist not only causes physical injuries, but leaves behind a scar on the most cherished position of a woman, which is her dignity, honor, reputation and chastity. Despite so many amendments in the laws, the crime of rape continues unabated. In fact, it is extremely distressing to see the surge in the number of cases being reported from all corners of the country. We seriously need to introspect that we as a society have failed miserably and it is high time we put in concerted efforts to combat this dehumanizing act. There is also an urgent need to sensitize the public police, lawyers, as well as the judges to ensure the reintegration of survivor in the society. Thank you.